about 22, maybe 23 years ago, um, 23 years ago, I bet, I took Heather um, on her first ski trip, and we went off uh, on a quick trip to um, go to Red River to go skiing, and she had never been. We went, we had a good time, except for the fact that she fell down on the, the mountain, and I said, get up. And she said, I don't know how. And I laid down, and I hopped up, and I was like, like this. And she said, I don't know how you're doing that. I've never been on here. I've never been on snow. And I was like, no, it's really easy. You just, you just pop up. Oh, she got mad at me. Like, she could not do this like that. And I get home, and my dad said, why didn't you tell her to put the poles to the side and just push up? And I said, well, I didn't even think about that, right? And she just stared at me for a long time. This is still a point of contention in our marriage to this day. I'm not doing it. But what I want to bring up is on the trip, we took two young men. Uh, one was my brother that went, and he had snowboarded and skied just like I skied growing up and knew what he was doing. But he brought a friend with him. Now, this kid uh, was from Sunray, where my brother was living, and he was an ornery kid just like my brother was. They were constantly on the road. We were having to tell them, hey, be quiet back there. It was a one-day trip. We got up early. We were coming back late. Please quit being obnoxious. Calm down. Uh, but they were just so loud, and they just kept going all the time. And I thought, man, I do not want to be around these kids whatsoever, right? About a year and a half later, um, he died in war. That kid and my brother had choices they were going to make, and he chose to be a Marine. And his battle and what was happening is he got up, it was in Afghanistan, and he uh, uh, took the top of a, a building and was setting up there. It was supposed to be an easy transport uh, with the soldiers down on the road to be able to come, and all of a sudden, gunfire opened up all over the place, and he knew that bullets were coming from everywhere all around him, and he didn't know what to do. So the story is, what his battalion said, is he ran to the door where the rest of his soldiers were coming up at, and he grabbed it, and he locked the door where they could not get on the roof. And he stood up there taking fire and shooting and trying to make sure that everybody could get over there. And he was hit multiple, multiple times, and he died. But they said the transport was able to get through. Now, I wonder what his family thought whenever they got the news that he had passed away. I wonder what it would be like. I wonder if they were sitting there, some of them saying, I told him not to go. I told him. I wonder if, if he was able to. I don't believe in ghosts. I believe we go to heaven. The Bible says to be absent with the, the body is to be present with the Lord. I believe that if he knew Jesus, he was right there with him, and I believe that he did from stories I heard. But if he was able to come back, I wonder if they were asking him, saying, was it worth it? Was it worth it? And I imagine if he looked at him and said, all those men that were able to go and to live, it was absolutely worth the sacrifice that I gave. Because the moment he put the uniform on, the moment he swore in, the moment that he took that, he made a commitment, a covenant, that he would be willing to die for his country if it meant others could live. Tomorrow's Memorial Day. It's not Armed Forces Day. Armed Forces Day is the day where we honor those that are in the military and actively serving. It's not Veterans Day. Veterans Day is the day that we sit there and we remember those that have been in military and have uh, exited and, and, and living their life, but they are soldiers or they are uh, seamen forever. They have that inside of them and we honor them. But Memorial Day is remembering those who gave the best sacrifice they could possibly give for others to live. Well, the title of my message today kind of goes with that. It is difficult but worth it difficult but worth it. Open up your Bibles to Joshua chapter 5. We've been going through verse by verse through the book of Joshua, which I like to do. Uh, I want to tell you again why I do that uh, while you're getting there in Joshua 5. Uh, years ago, I would preach a lot of topical sermons, and I would do that. And I started noticing there was time that God was laying on my heart to preach some very difficult passages. 
And in truthfulness is, there was times that I cowered down and I didn't do it because I was worried that it would hurt some people. And then there were also times that I felt like I was preaching an agenda, what I wanted to preach to get my point across to somebody. Well, the Lord really convicted me about it and said, if you'll preach verse by verse, the Word of God will convict. You just need to be faithful to the text. So that's what I had to do. There's lots of preachers that can preach topical. There's lots of preachers that can preach a sermon series based on ideas and stay very true to the Word of God. This is the way I have to preach this. All right, so we're in Joshua chapter 5, difficult but worth it. I'll talk about it a little bit more here in a second, but I want to read to you verses 1 through 9 first, 1 through 9, and then we'll go back and we'll discuss that as well. When all the Amorite kings across the Jordan to the west and all the Canaanite kings near the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, listen, they lost her heart and their courage failed because of the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israel men again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelite men at Gilbeth and Haroth. But this is the reason Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness along the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out were circumcised, none of the people born in the wilderness along the way were circumcised after they had come out of Egypt. For the Israelites wandered in the wilderness 40 years until all the nation's men of war came out of Egypt had died off because they did not obey the Lord. So the Lord vowed never to let them see the land that he had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Joshua raised up their sons in their place. It was these he circumcised. They were still uncircumcised since they had not been circumcised along the way. After the entire nation had been circumcised, they stayed where they were in the camp until they were covered. The Lord then said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the disgrace of Egypt from you. Therefore, that place is called Gilgal to this day. By the way, I've never said the word circumcision as much as I just did right then. Not a word that just rolls off the tongue, you know what I mean? Now listen. Here's what's happened, we see in the passage, when the Amorite kings across the Jordan and Canaanite kings heard about what had happened. And this is what had happened. They had crossed the Jordan River at flood depth. It was time for Israel to take the promised land. And we knew what had happened, that the Lord said, because of this, what he had done, you were to take these stones and set them up as a memory of what he had done. I had last week some stones for you guys. Many of you took them, and you wrote the date that you had accepted the Lord. It was a memorial stone, something for you to remember, or a day that something great had happened, the Lord in your life, the day that you were baptized, whatever it was we have people that were watching the sermons from different states and i got pictures from many of them of stones that they went and found and they wrote memorial dates on there things that were great isn't that awesome when God moves, the enemy is absolutely terrified. Whether you want to believe it or not, the spiritual warfare that takes place, God is all-powerful and the enemy is afraid. When it was time for the Israelites, who were not the largest nation, who were not the most powerful nation, and when it was time for them to cross over, the Lord parts the, Red, or parts the Jordan River for them to be able to cross on dry land. Absolutely terrified the kings in the land the amorites the canaanites they've lost heart because they know the israelites are coming and god's coming with them terrified now we get to this covenant and i want to explain something a covenant usually takes a a sacrifice but maybe not this radical right i mean this is a pretty radical sacrifice that's in here. Uh, I, I want you to understand that this was a, a covenant. This circumcision had been a covenant that had been established once before with Abraham. In Genesis 17, 9, it says, God also said to Abraham, has for you, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations are to keep my covenant. 
This is my covenant which you're to keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every one of your males must be circumcised. You must circumcise the flesh of their foreskin to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you at the eight days old is to be circumcised. This includes a slave born in your household and one purchased with money from any foreigner. The one who is not your offspring, a slave born in your house as well as one purchased with money, must be circumcised. My covenant will be marked in your flesh as an everlasting covenant. If any male is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that man must be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. The Mosaic law also followed into this covenant. In Leviticus 2 or 12, 2, it says, Tell the Israelites, when a woman becomes pregnant and gives birth to a male child, she will be unclean seven days as she is during the days of her menstrual impurity. The flesh of his foreskin must be circumcised on the eighth day. I want you to imagine, I talked about uh, choosing your passages. Imagine... Uh, sitting there being a preacher, and the Lord says, we're going to preach on circumcision today. That's not something most pastors just get overly eager to talk about, right? At all. That's not something that's super excited. This was definitely, without a doubt, a sacrifice that they had to do. Am I right? Imagine them coming to him and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Joshua, I, I kind of halfway wonder whenever the Lord was talking to him in Joshua 1, he said, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. The Lord your God goes with you wherever you want. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. The Lord goes with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous. I kind of halfway wondered if this is where it comes into play a little bit. Uh, everybody listen to me. All you men, we got a fun activity today. Huh? He's going to have to be strong and courageous at this particular point. And by the way, if he's wondering if the people are really going to follow him, now is the test. Am I right? All right. Okay, guys, this is what we're going to have to do. And this was a, a covenant, and the covenant had been broken by these very people's parents. They broke it. Like many other things that happen in the wilderness, disobedience, uh, disregard for God, disregard for his commandments, they broke it. Now a new generation has rose up. And here they are, having to make this sacrifice. I had a guy, we talked about it in class, I was in a men's study group one time, and we were talking about circumcision in the covenant, and we were talking about it, how it says in the scripture in Joshua, how they were supposed to take flint knives and sharpen them, and then they were going to go to the procedure. And we start talking through and, and start getting into discussion and try to skip it. And this one man said, hold on, hold on, hold on. We need to talk about this for just a sec. What do you mean flint rocks for this? And we said, well, there wasn't scalpel. There wasn't this unbelievable antiseptic or pain relievers that were in there. I mean, this was... A sacrifice, that's what it was designed to be, a sacrifice for it, with a flint rock. And uh, he sat there and he looked, his face was kind of bleak and quiet, and uh, we go, okay, we're going to go on. And so we start going on, and he goes, no, no, we need to go back to this and talk about it. And we start talking, and he was like, I need to understand the process of this. And so uh, in a descriptive way that we won't get in today, and which I'm sure you're thankful about, we talked about that process. And then I was like, all right, let's go on and continue on. We start continuing on, and he raises his hand again. He's like, no, we're not done with this. I have to understand how this happened. And, and, I, and he was like, and the people just followed God when he said to do this? Like we talk about build an ark. We talked about it in our Sunday school class today. Building an ark. Rain had never felled. Okay, we'll do it. Leaving your land, Abraham, following off. Abraham taking the steps of faith to sacrifice his son before God stopped it. All these things of faith. But when we get to this one, I want you to understand this was a huge sacrifice. Massively. And here they are having to face this. Now think about this. If the question was to establish a covenant with God, how easy would it have to be before you would follow him? How, how difficult would it be for you not to follow him? 
I heard a preacher one time that he got out a $1 bill and said, if you'll go share your faith, I'll give you this $1 bill. And how many of you will be taking the courage to do that? And, and nobody came forward. He was like, I have a $10 bill. How many of you will do it? And like one or two people came up and they got a $10 bill. And they were ready to do it. And he was like $20. And he keeps going, gets to $100. And there was people getting up and they were coming and getting the $100 to share. How much money would it cost for you to be faithful? Okay. Now it's not about the reward you get. How about the sacrifice you have to take? How painful would it be for you to do this? Okay, it, here's the deal. Uh, you're going to get out and you're going to have to be uncomfortable for your faith today uh, in following the Lord. Would you be willing to do it? Yeah, I'll, I'll be uncomfortable. We're sitting in a church where we can't decide if the air conditioner is too cold or too hot. And, and we could easily leave here and say, I sacrificed. It was too hot in there today, but I serve the Lord. Right? We go off and say, all right, you're going to go be a missionary and you're going to have to, to, to go to the, an area across town and you're going to go serve over there. Would you go serve over there? Yeah, okay, I'll do it. I'm willing to make the sacrifice, leave what is comfortable. Okay, now you're going to go be a missionary. We're going to call you to the ends of the earth and you're going to go off and you're going to serve in another country. Would you be willing to do it? Well, I don't, I don't know about that. Okay, how about this? You're going to go off and serve somewhere, and here's going to be the thing. Certain death awaits you. You're going to go share the gospel, and there are going to be people there that they are going to come together. They will kill you for your faithfulness. Will you go? Do you get what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, the sacrifice is hard. But we don't have to do that anymore. We're not under that, that covenant, right? Look at what Acts says in 15, verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and they began to teach the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the customs prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 5 says, but some of the believers from the party of the Pharisees stood up and they said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Go to verse 7, it says, after this, there had been much debate. Peter stood up and he said to them, Brothers, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by the mouth the Gentiles who would hear the gospel uh, message and believe, and God who knows the heart testified to them by giving the Holy Spirit just as he also did us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, listen to this, we believe we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. Praise God, we are under, not under the law anymore, am I right? I like to eat bacon, you like to eat bacon, right? I like to eat shellfish, you like to eat shellfish. And praise the God, we don't have to do that type of sacrifice anymore. None of it, right? We are completely free from that kind of sacrifice. Woo! Jesus said, in regards to sacrifice, Matthew 10, 38, and whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of Circumcision, temporary pain, taking up a cross, dying to yourself, and following him. I would say that sacrifice is a little deeper, wouldn't you? How about this one? In regards to being faithful, Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, anyone who is not with me is against me, and anyone who does not gather with me scatters. I mean, we may not be under the law, but it still seems like Jesus put some pretty big requirements with this. Be willing to die for yourself. Take up the cross. Follow me. And by the way, the people he's talking to in that passage directly, even though the phenomenon of Scripture is he's still talking to us today, the people he was directly talking to were going to have to take up their cross and die. It's a big sacrifice. See, a covenant with God, it does take re requirement. It does have a covenant that is established with us. And, and that covenant still is sacrificed by blood. It was by the blood of the Lamb. And the covenant was established 
with each of us. And what it means is we're to walk by faith. We're going to have the Holy Spirit within us. We're going to show the world what Jesus Christ has done. And we will be an image of him to all that are around us. I have a friend who had a little brother, or actually a big brother, that had a, a, a mental illness. Something came, took place and, and uh, had a mental illness. And, and the man had to be kept. I think that his, his never developed past... Uh, Three years old, am I right, Bill? And uh, he was in a nursing home and assisted living, and uh, uh, my friend Bill, his brother, would go see him every single day. He'd go with him, and he'd spend time with him and sit with him, and they couldn't have deep conversation. They would talk about Jesus sometimes, and and, uh, he was happy to talk about Jesus, but he'd go sit with him all the time, every day. And I remember thinking, how hard this must be whenever he moved him back to Pampa to be with him. And he would sacrifice going all the time. All the time. When he was sick and he was hurting, uh, Bill, he would, his eyes would fill with tears. And, and Bill's got these uh, bright eyes and they would fill with tears and he would struggle with it. And he would talk about how much he loved his brother and being with him all the time. And the day happened that he passed away. And uh, I remember, I just, it hit me as clear as day that one day Bill will see him in heaven. And imagine him so excited to go to him and see his brother that he loved so much. And imagine coming up to him and no longer does he have a three-year-old mind. Imagine him being just perfect and looking at him and saying, Bill, thank you for loving me so much. I know it was a sacrifice but you loved me the way God told you to. That's sacrifice, right? And every one of us are called to our own areas of sacrifice. We're not going to have a ceremony where we have to have a circumcision of ceremony. We're not under that. But we are under a different type of covenant. It is the covenant established by the blood of the Lamb that we are supposed to follow Him, take up our cross, die, follow Him, serve Him, be with Him, not against Him. Follow Him wherever He tells us to go. Praise God, he hasn't called me to the ends of the earth to have to go be a missionary full-time in a certain area, that I get to be right here in our area. But there are people that are being called that haven't responded yet, that are going to face persecution. You look at the world we live in right now, and you think of our missionaries, our kids that we put in the public school system, that have to stand up for their faith. And you tell me, it's not going to get harder as it goes on. Usually takes a sacrifice, and, and, and we think maybe it's not that radical, but it's even kind of more radical following. How about this? Let's look in verse 10 through 12 of chapter 5, and we need to understand, we may fail on our efforts, but God never fails. Am I right? Look at this in verse 10 through 12. While the Israelites camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, They kept the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month. The day after the Passover, they ate unleavened bread and roasted grain from the produce of the land. And the day after they ate from the produce of the land, the manna ceased. Since there were no manna for the Israelites, they ate from the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Now, we assume, because those of us that have been in church forever, we just kind of go on a lot of times and assume that everybody understands what that was about. But let me explain it to you. The Passover, for those of you that maybe didn't grow in church or that had a background like you had talked about straight from drugs, is this. The Israelites, the Hebrew people, had been faithful and followed the Lord, and and they went into Egypt, a long story of how it came about, came in and the land prospered and everything was great. And then, After a while, they got held in captivity because they became so numerous, the Pharaoh became absolutely fearful of them, and so they enslaved them and made them work for them. Moses, who was one of the people, was raised, a Hebrew person, was raised in the Pharaoh's court as a family member. One day, he saw the Hebrews out there being beat by one of the the Egyptian slave drivers, and he killed the man. The next day, he goes out, Two Hebrews are fighting, and he goes up to talk to them, and 
try to visit with them, and they look at them and say, what, are you going to kill one of us too? So now the Egyptians are mad at him, the Hebrews are mad at him, and he flees for his life, and he takes off running. After being gone for quite a while, the Lord appears to him in a burning bush, and he tells him that it's time for him to go back into Egypt and set the people free. So he has to go back. He does not want to go back. The Lord has to convince him to go back. He goes back and he stands before uh, Pharaoh and they have this talk about letting the people go. And each time they have a talk about it, uh, he would deny it. Pharaoh would deny it. And a plague would hit the place. And when the plague would hit, after a little while, the Pharaoh's magicians would try to match the plague. And it kept happening over and over until the Pharaoh's magicians could not. But each time, Pharaoh would harden his heart and he'd say, I will not let the people go. I will not let the people go. And it comes to this last sacrifice. And our last uh, uh, plague, and here's what it was. Every house that was not going to be covered, their doorpost, by the blood of a pure, spotless lamb, the angel of death was going to come, the angel of the Lord, and it was going to kill the firstborn male that was there. And so what would happen the night before? There was a sacrifice. People would take this pure spotless lamb they would take the blood and they would hiss up and they would put it on their doorpost and then they would go in and they would huddle together and you can imagine the next morning after the lord had passed by the weeping and crying in the land of those that were not covered by the blood of the lamb And they were told to remember this, to keep this in remembrance. Remember what God did, because it was at that plague, after that happened, that Pharaoh finally released the people and they were free to go. Even though they relented and turned back and tried to change their mind, it was at this point that God had released them and they were willing to go. So they were supposed to cover and follow the remembrance of the blood of the lamb and have a meal that would sacrifice and represent the Passover that was there to protect them. And then it says they didn't get to eat manna of the lamb because it ran away. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We don't really know what manna is. There was some description about it, but we don't understand. It was a heavenly bread that was given to them, which I describe as sopapillas. And I don't know if that's the case, but that's what I kind of describe it as. I think of it like that. It was a beautiful, wonderful, heavenly type bread, and it ran out on them. The Lord had stopped it because he was going to provide for them now from the land that they were going to go in. Remember, the land of milk and honey. Okay. So, here they are remembering the sacrifice that had taken place. Now, imagine it's while the men are recovering after having this tough time of a circumcision, knowing they are about to walk into a land where enemies await them and they are going to have to conquer it and they have to trust in what God is going to do. So they go back and they remember the Passover. All right. You spared us then. I believe you're going to spare us now. You're going to take care of us. Well, I mean, we don't have to follow circumcision, so we don't have to follow the Passover, right? And you're right, you don't have to follow the exact uh, order of the, the, the mill and trying to follow with it. You're absolutely right, but here's what you do have to do. You have to realize this, to go to heaven, you have to be covered by the lamb. You do. To be spared death is to be covered by the blood of the lamb. Now, it's not a a little lamb that we slaughter and we have to get up there and we had to raise it and we go and we take the blood and we put it on our doorstep and and if we have that, we're covered. No, it's far greater than that. What it was was a sacrifice of one lamb that came to this earth that was perfect, that was absolutely without blemish, great. His name was Jesus. And he got up on a cross and the blood was shed and everybody that has confessed him as Lord and believed in their heart, God raised him from the dead. They will be saved, covered by the Lamb, the great Passover. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? I think that's an amazing thing. And and to know that that blood of the Lamb and that protection still saves to this day. 
My friend Bill and I, Bill is from Pampa. One day we were doing construction at our church that we had in, in uh, Pampa, Calvary, and uh, we were taking bids of who was going to turn this one office into two different offices. And we had a bid that came in that was really cheap, and we had a bid that came in real expensive. We had another one that came that was about right in the middle, and Bill came to me and he said, we need to take this one in the middle because the guy really needs Jesus. And we talked about it. He said, this would be really good. He needs them. Let him come in. And so we talked about it, and we decided that we were going to have this guy come and do it. His name was Mike. And uh, Mike came in, and he was a wild man. He came in and immediately started dropping some cuss words at me, and he was doing it to test me. How was I going to respond to him, right? And so I would just sit there and listen to it, and then I would talk about something else and, and change it. And then he sat there, and he would talk to me because I had OU stuff on the wall, and he was a diehard Texas fan. And I would tell him that, that the Bible says the Lord cuts the horns off the wicked. And uh, we would talk about how, how the, the OU is obviously God's choice. It is crimson like the blood of Jesus washed us white as snow with the cream. I was like, the very colors represent Christ. I was like, it's got to be the right thing. And he would go, oh, here we go. And we would get into these arguments about it and fights and 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 just pick all the time during that time his son got in a very bad car wreck and died and bill calls me and tells me about it and so i go over to the house and uh, i go outside and he smelt like beer and he was struggling and uh, had his shirt off and uh, i went up to him and he looked at me he started crying he just gave me a hug and i hugged him for what seemed like eternity and then he looked at me and he said, I have to go inside. And he turned and he walked inside. We didn't say anything. Anyways, the work had been done at the church and I hadn't seen him in a long time. There was a God in me, a Boy Scouts camp that was done. And uh, he was big into Boy Scouts of his grandson, the, the one whose son had died. He took him in and was helping try to raise him. And they had a Boy Scouts camp and, and it was a Christian camp and and uh, they went to it, and they were going to do this ceremony at our church on a Sunday morning and announce what God had done during that time. And I walked around the corner, and I see him. I did not know he was going to be a part of that group, and he was there. And he looks at me, and he comes up to me, puts his arm around my hand, and then he yells, Kids! Kids, come here! The church is walking by. Everybody stops and looks at this wild man. Kids! And all of a sudden, his grandkids come around the corner, and they're looking at him. He said, come here, come here. So they come there, and he goes, do you know who this is? And they're just like, I've never seen this guy in my life. And he said, this is the guy that came and hugged me whenever your daddy died. is that crazy? He sat in church that day, and it really started penetrating to his heart. And he was like, well, I think I'm going to stay. And one day, I was teaching an evangelism class on a Wednesday night, and uh, we're in this class, and he comes, and he bangs on the door, and uh, he opens it up, and, and I said, Mike, we're in the middle of class. Can I talk to you later? And he said, yeah, but I really need to talk to you. And I said, okay, but I'm in the middle of class. Can, you know, can we talk it a little bit? Yep, we'll talk it a little bit. Here in a little bit, I see him walk by through the windows, and he's got our associate pastor, and he walks by with him. And then here in a little bit, he comes back, and he bangs on the door again. And I opened it up and said, Mike, we're still in class. And this is what he said, I don't need you anymore. And I thought, well, okay. And uh, he said, I just talked with Richard and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I thought, wow. And I always thought of him as the wild man for Christ. He'd tell anybody about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus in his wild man voice. And I remember thinking, if God can save him, he can save anybody. He can. You know why? Because he was covered by the blood of the Lamb. Covered by the blood of the Lamb. See, we sit there and we say, we don't have to have a covenant of sacrifice anymore, but yet Scripture says, take up your cross and follow me. That is a covenant of sacrifice. And then we can sit there and say, well, we don't have to adhere to the, the Passover sacrifice or the meal anymore. We don't have to do that. You're exactly right. Because we've been covered by the blood of the Lamb once and for all. And that blood still saves. Now, a covenant takes sacrifice, but maybe not usually that radical. We fall on our, we fell on our efforts, but God never does. He's faithful in saving us. And then what about this? They need to be reminded that they serve a holy God. Maybe we do too. 
When Joshua was nearing Jericho in verse 13, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and he asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I've now come as a commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua bowed with his face to ground in worship and he asked him, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Go back to Moses when Moses was going to go. Kick off the whole thing for them to go to the land that they were supposed to go. And it started with a burning bush. And do you remember what God said to him? Take off your sandals. The place where you are is holy. Go to Joshua, who has taken the reins. A new generation has come up, crossing the land. And the Lord says to him once again, take off your shoes. The place where you are standing is holy. Who, who's the angel, though, right? Like, who is it? The angel, the commander of the Lord? We know that in, in Scripture, what we believe is there's three archangels. Can you guys tell me the archangels that are out there? Who, who's the first one, the most common one? We see? Michael. Who's the second one that we see that's usually making announcements? Gabriel. Who's the third? Lucifer, right? You remember when Lucifer fell, became Satan, and he fell from heaven? He took how many of the angels with him? A third of them, right? A third of them out there. So we get to this point, and we say, well, who is this angel? And there's two real common theories of who they think it could be. Some people think that it is a Christophany. Do you know what a Christophany is? It's where you see Jesus in the Old Testament. And and we do see him in the Old Testament. We see God walking in the garden when God is in man form. That's a Christophany. We see it with Abraham whenever he's talking to him while the two angels go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. One stays back, and as he's talking, we realize that's the Lord. That is a Christophany. I personally believe Melchizedek is a Christophany. I believe those things that take place. I do. So some people believe that this is a Christophany, appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament, because he falls to the ground and worships him, and he even calls him Lord. Problem with that is the word Lord that is used there is not always the same as Lord and Savior or Lord of all things. Now, I'm not the greatest Hebrew scholar. I'm I'm not by any means. I'm not that great at it, and I didn't overly research what that is. I didn't overly research what the Hebrew word for circumcision is. I just know that whenever it comes out to a definition, it means ouch. But I do know this, that this sacrifice or this angel that was right there, whatever it is, the Lord or not, I do know this, that whenever he tells them that the place where he's standing is holy, he's supposed to take off his shoes. Now, second theory, an angel of the Lord can mean absolutely commander and not necessarily the Lord. If the idea of it, whenever he bows down in respect, could be a point of absolutely understanding this was from the Lord. It's from the Lord. Now, I'm not smart enough to understand exactly how it is. I'm not. I'm not smart enough. And I could sit here and I could try to argue all the theories and what I personally believe in. I don't know, but here's what I do know. A heavenly being showed up in front of him and told him to take his shoes off because the place where he was standing is holy and he bowed down and worshipped him. I do know that for a fact. I know that. And I do know this, that this was a great time of reminder for them because we have been told that Joshua is to be strong and courageous to follow the Lord. And as he's nearing Jericho, looking at the power of the city, knowing about the Amorites and the Canaanites, they didn't know that they had lost heart. But they had lost heart as he's looking at it, realizing he's about to send some people to war, and they may be happen to have a memorial day to remember those that had died. As he's looking at them, he very easily could have been nervous or scared. But an angel of the Lord appears, sitting there reminding him, follow God's plan. Follow God's plan. I remember hearing a story one time... Um, do you guys know uh, um, Tony Evans? Do you guys know the preacher Tony Evans? Tony Evans is a wonderful preacher down in the Dallas area. And if you ever listen to him, he, he's really great. You may not agree with everything all the time, but, oh, man, he's wonderful. And he is great at illustrations. He told an illustration one time, this is no joke, about his wife had wanted this new refrigerator. 
And so they bought this new refrigerator, and he was like, man, it's unbelievable. You can go up and touch it, and a screen comes up, and you could see everything that's inside of it. You could touch it, and you could have it make coffee. There's a coffee slot in there to make coffee. He said, the other day I went up to it, and I said, fridge, make toast. And it didn't make toast. He said, fridge, cook me a meal. And it didn't cook him a meal. And he was like, what is this? This absolutely doesn't make sense. It's got all these features and it won't do that. And he said, it did not do it because that was not the reason that it was made. It was made to keep stuff cold and to freeze it, not to cook him a meal. And he said, when you operate or expect people to operate outside of what the Lord's calling is, you will always be disappointed. By the end of that illustration, I was remember going, am I saved? Like it was just unbelievable. It was wonderful. And he told another illustration that I think about when I hear this passage. What he said was, on Sunday morning in the fall, there's two teams that take a field. And one will come out, and everybody's going to boo them. They're going to yell at them, because they are the away team. Everybody's going to hate them. And then another team's going to come out, and everybody's going to cheer them, and they're going to think how great they are because this is the home team. People are going to be wearing their, their uniforms and so excited about it, and these two giant people or teams are going to crash on a field, and they're going to hit each other. They even call it the grid iron. It's supposed to be powerful. They're like gladiators going to crash and hit each other, and they are so powerful. One will push one back. One will push the other back. They're going to fight for everything they have, and he said, but in reality, reality there's three teams and the third team gets out there and they've got white and black shirts on and they're not near as big as these powerful football players they're littler they're shorter they're not as strong and built on it littler guys but they blow a whistle and they stop all the action they can tell those giant people that they did something wrong and they can back them up 15 yards they can even kick people out whenever they grab a face mask or they grab the back of their, their, their shoulder pads and pull them down from behind. They can absolutely kick them out. They can stop play, move people forward, move people back, and these giant people have to obey them because in New York City there is a house or a building where they have put together and formulated this little book. And that little book goes in the hands of those people wearing the black and white shirts. And it's called the rule book. And they have to adhere to it. I think about that a lot of times when I think about this story because of this. As Christians, we are neither the home team or the away team. We are the ones that are supposed to carry the word of God and show everybody what the rules say. Right? It's not about sitting there saying, Who's going to win Republicans or who's going to win Democrats or what the big fights are? God is still on his throne either way on any of it. Our job is to point people to Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what I think on this. Who is it? I don't know who it is. What the story is, I don't understand the power of it. But I do know this. To remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. Somebody told me not long ago, they, they brought up a, a statement, and it was a big statement. They said uh, they had visited the church, and when they visited the church, they, they liked it. They liked the music. They liked the preaching. Uh, they had called me from out of state, and they said uh, the problem they had was, and this was what they brought up, was that somebody brought coffee into the sanctuary, and they were very upset about it and uh, were mad. And they said they do not think that that belongs in the church. Now, Many of us grew up, how many of you guys grew up in a church where you didn't dare bring coffee into this church service? Yeah, right. Uh, that was a big deal. We did not do that. How many of you grew up where, where everybody wore suits and ties and, and they always tried to dress their best when they came to church? Many of us did. That was, and there's, we're supposed to give our best to the Lord, right? That's, that's what we're supposed to do. Well, uh, I asked the person a question. I said, how much church etiquette do I have to teach somebody before we allow them to come in the doors of the church? Right? How much, how much do I have to tell them uh, you need to be wearing a uh, suit and tie your absolute best? Or, or how much of it do I sit there and say, um, you, you cannot bring any other drink in here. You're not allowed. If you do, you, you have to leave. You're not welcome here. 
Right, we don't, we don't do that. It's not what it is. But we do try to point people to the holiness of God, right? I'm not near as worried, even though it can make a mess, I'm not near as worried about what comes in as showing them and teaching them what reverence looks like as they grow in the church. We're not going to have a class that sits there and says, 12 weeks of teaching you what reverence is before you're welcome in the doors. Because can I tell you something? You weren't holy either when you came in. You weren't righteous. But the Lord loved you anyway. Well, who, whose side are we on? Here's the deal. The side that I am on is I had to take up my cross and follow the Lord. And I had to know that I was covered by the blood of the Lamb. And I want to stand up and realize that everywhere I go and the Lord goes with me, that is a holy place. It's not the building. We already know for a fact that the flood can happen in our building. We can take it away and we can still worship the Lord. Am I right? Yeah. Because it's not about the building that's the church, and it's not about being Southern Baptist, and it's not about being First Methodist, and it's not about any of that stuff, because I believe without a doubt it's the cross before the steeple. What I do know is this. You're the church, and you're the place to point people to the holiness of God. So my question today, what are you doing following the Lord? What sacrifices He may be calling you to do and if you've never truly given your life to him, died to your old way of life and given to him, we want you to run down here in a minute and tell you how you can be covered by the blood of the Lamb. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do for those of you that are Christians, for those of you that have been baptized, you follow the Lord. I'm going to ask you this. This week, would you ask the Lord, what is it you want me to do today? What is it you want me to do today? What is the quote that Mark Twain says? The two greatest days of a person's life is one, when they're born, and number two, when they find out why. You have a purpose. What's your why? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you to be with us right now. I ask you to speak to our hearts, to draw us close to you. Lord, that we will follow you. No matter where you lead us, we'll go Lord, I, I think a lot of times that my kids have selective hearing, that I, I'll tell them to do something and they act like they don't hear or they don't want to hear. And, and I know when I was a child, I had the same thing. Lord, what I fear is that Christians have developed the same habit, that we don't want to listen to what your Spirit leads us to do. Lord God, I pray that you remind us a covenant has been established with us by the sacrifice that's taken place, the confessing of you. Lord God, I pray that we remember the blood that was shed for us. We thank you so much for Zay and his calling out to Jesus and, and his willing to show everybody the holiness of God and what he's done in life. God, maybe others need to do the same. Lord, I thank you for the reminder that it's not about the building that's holy. It's about the people in the room that have been covered by the blood of the Lamb that represent the holiness to this world. Lord God, I ask you to be with us now. Draw us to you. If somebody's here that you've been leading them to do something and they just haven't had the courage, give them that boldness. Be strong and courageous. Maybe they need to come down. Lord God, maybe there's those here that they've never truly surrendered to that, that salvation to be covered by the blood. Give them that courage. Lord, maybe there's those that are here that have been white-knuckling it and haven't surrendered to that baptism that they're supposed to do. Lord, give them the courage. Whatever you want to do in here, may people join the church or to stand and sing in hallelujah, whatever it is. God, I just pray that we're a people that is faithful to where you're leading us. Lord God, I ask you to be with us now. Convict the hearts of your people to follow you, that we will be faithful wherever you lead us to go. In Jesus' name.